Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of SpinCast. Today, we're diving back into the world of collegiate esports. Joining me is Jim Lowry. He is the program director of the Upper Iowa University esports program. So, Jim, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So to kind of get us started off, give us a little bit of your background, right? Kind of what sparked you to get more engaged um, and end up becoming the program director um, of a collegiate esports program? And, you know, what's what sparked that? Where did your passion start in the esports space um, and kind of define that pathway for us? Uh, it's, it's kind of a weird story, actually. Uh, my claim to fame with esports goes all the way back to the days of StarCraft Brood War, uh, you know, on ladders that nobody actually paid attention to. Uh, and that was way probably 20, geez, I'm old, 20 years ago now. Uh, but then it was on the back burner. Like I've been a gamer forever, but it was always on the back burner. I got into working with collegiate athletics. And a few years ago, the university I'm, I'm working at, Upper Iowa University, uh, they decided that they were going to branch out. They want, they heard about esports. They heard it was growing. Uh, they, my boss came to talk to me. He goes, Jim, you know, you're a gamer, right? I go, yeah. He goes, what do you think about esports? I said, I think it's a great idea. I think it's growing faster than anybody could believe. He goes, great. Do you think you could put together a team for us? I said, for what? He goes, for esports. I'm like, you know, it's more than just one game, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And he kind of shook his head. He's like, I, I know. I didn't quite know that. And so we had a big discussion about what we were going to look for, what games we were going to shoot for. Uh, and so that's how I got back into the scene. Uh, was the school decided to expand and you know they knew they had a, a total nerd in myself and <laughs> they uh, had me start the program and we started really simply like a lot of programs do with league of legends and overwatch uh and it's expanded from there yeah absolutely you know league of, Leg league of legends overwatch are kind of those two marquee esports that sparked a lot of really anything in that esports space they were kind of the ogs to, um, that really caught on in a mainstream fashion right there are games kind of before them but they're the ones that went international massive scale lots of media attention um so yeah that's definitely um that common trend i i always love to hear that of like you know these the athletic directors that are so ingra are ingrained in traditional sports kind of come back like hey let's do esports and you're like okay what game and they're like what um, I've, I've totally, I've heard that so much and it's like, yeah, you know, it's esports. It's kind of like athletics, right? Athletics has football, basketball, baseball, swimming, track field, you know, a thousand more And the esports has League of Legends, Overwatch, Rocket League, Rainbow Six, so on and on, um, so on. And as you know, um, and it's always interesting because people are like, wait, what? Esports isn't one thing. It's like, no, no, no. It's a lot of things. <laughs> uh, but yeah, kind of going into your program and specifics, um, you know, you started with League of Legends um, and Overwatch, as you said, um, you know, what is, give us a snapshot of your program now. What other games do you compete in, if any? What competitions do you play in? Um, what does your program look like from a structural perspective and kind of what your goals are from season to season? So at the moment, uh, the games that we're playing, participating in right now have actually changed a lot because it all depends on the players we, we can recruit yep. uh, and the walk-ons we get from on campus. So actually, although we only planned for League of Legends and Overwatch in our first year, we also competed in Counter-Strike and Fortnite. Uh, Fortnite, everybody thought was going to go away. Everybody's like, no, nah, that's this game. That's a joke that everybody's going to, it's going to go away. It's not going to matter. And here we are a couple of years later and Fortnite's still huge and everything that was supposed to replace it has fallen by the wayside. I yep. can't even remember the last time anybody's like, Hey, you want to play PUBG? Yeah. Hey, you want to play Apex Legends? I'm like, wait, those games still exist. What? You they, play that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ever sometime. So, uh, but this year we've got at the moment in the fall, we ran with Fortnite, Rocket, Rocket League, Overwatch and League of Legends and Rocket picking up Rocket League was huge for us. Our sports information director had been bugging me for a couple of years. Like, we need a Rocket League team. It's the only yeah. game I understand. It's soccer. I'm like, it's a little bit more than soccer, but okay, I get your point, Howie. Yeah. Uh, so those are the four we're running with at the moment. Uh, we were kind of disappointed. Last year, we had Dota 2 and Smite, mm -hmm. but the tournaments for those games dried up a little bit. Yeah. Just lack of interest. Mm -hmm. So we were a little bit upset there because we thought we had a pretty good Dota 2 team, and fielding a Smite team is basically the unicorn yeah. Uh, so, uh, but then this year we're participating in three different leagues, which is kind of how it goes with esports. It's really weird. Traditional sports, you're in one conference. Yep. You know, and with uh, with esports, you're in every conference you can find. Mm -hmm. So currently, we're we're participating with the NACE, which is the National Association of Collegiate Esports, the ECAC, which is the Eastern College Athletic Conference, and the NECC, which is the New England Collegiate Conference. Uh, so it's really weird sometimes with the scheduling because we'll look and say, okay, every game has a day 
for each league, but they're all different between the leagues. So on like a Monday, we might have three events going and they're all for a different league. So it just, it's yeah. kind of weird with the scheduling, especially when you've got kids, because we got two guys on the league team who also play Overwatch. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, we have to pick and choose which leagues we're going to play which games in because otherwise we're not going to have enough players. Yeah, absolutely. That's kind of like one of the, one of the difficulties and, you know, adversities you, every collegiate program has to overcome is like picking and choosing your battles quite literally because you can't play in all the competitions, right? So it's like, okay, what fits in my schedule this week? And then that might change next season because everything's so flexible and so fluid right now. Um, you know, I'd like to see some more structure come into esports in general um, at any level. And I think that would help a lot. But at the same time, it's awesome because it's more opportunities for the kids, right? You know, in college and football, you only play in the NCAA, right? That's it. There's no, really nothing else. But in esports, you know, you have the opportunity to play in things like NACE, ECAC, you know, play versus doing stuff, TESPA, so on and so forth. Um, so it's super awesome there. Um, but kind of on that point, you know, what other experiences have you had where you're like, hey, you know, do you wish, you know, for your program that there was more structure in Cleveland esports or more kind of that directed path where things didn't overlap as much or kind of where do you hope to see that idea kind of trends to trend towards um, in the next few years? Personally, I'm looking to see who jumps out to the front. Uh, mm -hmm. Really early, everybody thought it was going to be the NACE and they're doing a great job of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but the problem is, is that there's a lot of contenders right now. So it, at this point, it's going to come down to, can other people get to the level the NACE has gotten to? Mm -hmm. And then are they all going to merge or is, are they going to compete with each other similar to how the NAI tries to compete with the NCAA? Mm -hmm. uh, personally, uh, I like what the NECC is doing. Uh, they've got a lot of oversight, which is great because there's nothing worse than having a problem mid-match and having to wait 20 minutes for somebody to come you know, look at Discord and figure out, okay, there's a problem. We have to talk for 10 minutes about the problem. We have to discuss it for five more minutes with both coaches. And 45 minutes later, you might get the answer. Yeah. Uh, NECC, this is their first year running an esports uh, league. Uh, but they decided to go with a slightly different approach where they always have two, one or two people available during every match to mm -hmm. answer any questions or problems. Uh, and we had one problem early in the season. It was a very minor problem, but the answer was three minutes. Front to back, three minutes. We got back into the game. We kept going. It yep. was great. It was perfect. Uh, some of the coaches didn't like the fact that the way they structured the schedule meant that not everybody played at one time. They kind of tiered it over a four-hour period, but that allowed them to have basically officials there for everything. And mm. I'm a big fan of that. I'm a big fan of the structure. So I would fall on that side of it. I just don't know which league is going to be the one that comes out on top. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's usually always a winner in these kind of discussions. And I totally agree. I think the big thing is, you know, that structure. And with that structure comes like refs or admins, right? Whatever you want to call them in the esports space. It's like when you have a problem, like you were saying, and it's not addressed, that's like one of the most annoying things in the world because you're sitting there like, hey, I'm here. I want to play my match. I want to compete but I can't because there's a rule, you know, breakage or a rule at question. And we need someone to be like, yes or no, you can do this. You can't do this. So on and so forth. Um, so absolutely. You know, I love to see that those, you know, some leagues are trending towards that. And I think really that might define that ultimate success, right? A well-structured, well-organized and well-policed or reft league. That's kind of the three things in my mind. That's that successful kind of front runner um, in the end. Obviously, you know, money probably plays a role in there at some point, um, but totally agree on that. Um, kind of moving to my uh, next question is I know you have a background in traditional sports and I always like love to ask this question because I think there's a lot of similarities and differences between traditional sports, you know, football, basketball, baseball and esports, right? So really broad question, kind of what pops in your mind that, you know, the two can kind of use from each other to really improve both over time and then also kind of what sets them apart in your mind? Obviously, you know, there's a very obvious answer, but over time, where do you see those two kind of sitting in relation to each other? Uh, the biggest thing I see between the two of them is the mental side of everything, uh, which people look at me like I'm nuts. Uh, but I was with my team the other day after a devastating loss, and it was just like, you know, filming in a locker room after a football game where a team loses in overtime. Everybody's mm -hmm. there, their heads are hanging, you know, they're looking at the ground, and you got to kind of talk to them. You got to be like, guys, it wasn't that bad. We had a bunch of good stuff going on. We got to get ready. We got another one tomorrow. We can't sit here and, you know, talk about the past, uh, just like any football coach would do in the same situation. So on that side, the mental game, uh, I think is identical to traditional sports. 
you know, the mental fortitude, you know, something happens mid match, just like something could happen a mid basketball game. And you've got to be able to put it in the back of your mind and just, you know, kind of save it for later because you got something you got to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then something, you know, completely different is the fact that uh, unlike traditional sports, which might be at the mercy of weather, esports is at the mercy of whatever internet service provider you have. Yep. Um, <laughs> and uh, there is absolutely none of the leagues have any kind of allowance for an internet outage at the moment. Uh, it's all up to your opponent. If they want to give you a hard time about it, you might end up just having to forfeit. Yeah. Uh, and that's super different because it's something like, well, if this happened, this couldn't happen in traditional sports because both teams would be at the same disadvantage. Mm-hmm. Whereas playing in different locations, uh, it opens it up to the fact that something could happen in your location and you would just might be done. Yeah. Uh, that, and, that'll that's ne- and that'll never change. Yeah, those two points, I totally agree with. The mental side of sports and, tradi- and traditional sports and esports is so important. I would even say it's even more important in esports because you you have so much more thinking involved, right? I don't, I don't want to make, you know, traditional sound, sports sound like they're dumb, but they're not by any means. But, you know, esports is such a cognitive kind of inducing game. There's so many things to balance, and that's kind of who wins are those that are, like, mentally tuned into the game, so to say. And then also the internet problems, right? We've all experienced of lagging out of a game, you're like, this stinks like what am i supposed to do now and it's you're totally right you know maybe at some point we'll see something like a rain delay for an internet delay like hey you get an hour right and then after that we'll see if you have to reschedule you get one reschedule a month or something or maybe you get two kind of internet team reschedules of um, a season right to kind of provide for that leeway um, to make sure like hey you know that's completely out of everyone's control right even the internet service provider like how did this happen this technology um, so it's like the weather. No one can, no one really controls when that goes out. Right. It's totally agree there. Um, unfortunately we are running out of time here and I'll leave you with one last question that I asked everybody at the end um, is looking at esports in general, right? At all levels, everything involved in it. What's that next step that you think the industry needs to take to kind of overcome the NFL or world cup soccer, you know, these massive competitions that gain so much media attention, you know, and esports has a lot of viewership, but it's kind of within the esports world, right? So how do we engage the rest of the world in your eyes um, over the next few years to really kind of bring esports to the forefront of everybody? You see, I'm going to go a, a different direction from you here. I think they just need to keep doing what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, I think it's growing on its own and uh, the population is going to a a point where, you know, traditional TV, traditional media is falling by the wayside. More and more people are getting their media from digital online sources anyway. So at this point, I don't, I don't think esports needs, I don't want to say waste money, but I don't think they need to invest money trying to break into a medium that might not exist 15 years from now. You know, television, as we know, it can look completely different in 15 years. And you look at like the League of Legends World's Finals, which just happened. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're looking at, there was on Twitch, it was on YouTube, it was on League of Legends website, and they had millions of viewers. Mm -hmm. And it it was all controlled by them. They controlled all the advertising. I I think Twitch threw up some of their own advertising, but everything else was controlled by Riot Games. And, you know, they picked up a lot of money on that. And so I think what they're doing is perfect. Uh, personally, I mean, you saw Overwatch League, they tried to break into the television market and it failed miserably. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I really do think that's an incredibly good point because like you said, the world's evolving from, you know, how you absorb entertainment, right? We see everybody doesn't really watch cable TV anymore. Like you were saying, it's like streaming platforms, right? Like YouTube TV, like Netflix, like, you know, Disney Plus, right? And I could see maybe an esports version coming out. Like it's basically Twitch right now. Um, and really kind of that becoming the mainstay of, hey, I want to watch a com- competition of some sorts. I'm heading to Twitch or I'm heading to YouTube. And really that, that, that will become those main hubs of that advertisement space, that sponsorship space, because that's what makes the, the companies the money in the end, right? Is those being able to run those ads um, is how you make a lot of those dollars, which obviously the companies need to kind of you know, sustain themselves. Um, so, well, there is only- one right now. I think it's called ESTV, mm-hmm. Esports Television, I believe. Uh, yeah. And they're brand new, but I, I believe that one came out recently. 
Yeah, there we go. And I'm sure there'll probably be more competitors. I know Twitch and YouTube are both kind of having those esports. I know Twitch has that esports tab and YouTube is kind of trending to where there's kind of a separate location where there's a lot of highlighted stuff, right? So instead of general YouTube content that's kind of driven by, you know, those SEOs, it's a lot. There's an esports section where there's a different kind of algorithm highlighting the games you like or the, the content creators you like as well or the competition. So I'd be very interested to see how that kind of evolves over the next few years. Cause I think like you said, it will more than likely redefine that media space. Uh, but unfortunately we are out of time real quick. If you will, Jim, um, plug your program, tell us where we can find you on Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, any of the social medias or websites that y'all have out there. So um, anybody watching this as a high school student can reach out um, and kind of find out more about what your program is all about. Well, on Twitter, it's just at Peacock underscore esports. On Twitch, we're Peacock underscore esports. So we keep it uh, really simple there. Uh, we promote all of our, uh, our different teams on Twitch. We try to get all of them on there. Uh, and then we have casters as well. And we're actually looking to recruit casters too. So we're not just looking for mm -hmm. players. We're looking for casters as well. Uh, but yeah, everything is just Peacock underscore esports. And uh, we love it when people... People come and watch and you absolutely absolutely um thank you once again for coming on spincast today to our viewers and listeners um thanks for saying the entire time definitely give um jim and upper iowa the peacocks um a follow up there and to keep up to date and everything they're doing um over there in iowa uh, stay healthy and stay happy out there COVID's still a thing um take care of yourself take care of your loved ones and ultimately stay plugged in mm -hmm.